2024, 2024 BMF update. It's funny how things turn out. Big Meech's son has an acting career. It's funny how things turn out. After the long saga of BMF, 20 years in the criminal justice system, 20 years before that of being in the streets roughly, uh, the main thing that the outcome of all of it is is 50 Cent and some Hollywood producers are making money. Big Meech's son has an acting career. And as for everybody else, I don't know, still a lot of problems. So I'm going to give you an a update rundown of various people that were been part of the BMF thing and what's going on with them because there's so much. So first of all, j Chad Brown, who Blue Da Vinci, they claim they coined the name j short for Junior Boss as a joke, as a disparaging remark about uh, because he acted like he was in charge when he wasn't. Well, the feds certainly used that name against him and called him the second in command in the indictment. So you got to be careful what you let people call you. I don't know what j was or wasn't in BMF, but that's the gossip. But what I do know is that j got indicted a few months ago in St. Louis. And again, the power of a name, the feds called this a BMF indictment. Uh, well, j Bo's indicted for a PPP fraud and some maybe some wire fraud. It's all fraud. Uh, there's a guy with fentanyl distribution, somebody else meth, somebody else fentanyl, fentanyl and meth, money laundering. And then there's a girl who calls her, well, woman, she's 42, Tiffany Tiff BMF Nelson. She was indicted on money laundering. So... I don't know how this is a BMF case. I mean, the girl called herself BMF Tiff, and j used to be, well, was in a BMF indictment 20 years ago, and this wasn't even for him selling drugs. I don't know how this is a BMF indictment, unless you're the federal prosecutor and you want your press release to get the most clicks possible, and that's all that matters in America these days. How many clicks do you get, right? So... Chad J. Bro Brown, Chad J. Bo Brown facing fraud charges in the same indictment as a bunch of people with dope charges. It's a RICO. I, they're not hold. J. Bo doesn't have any dope charges at this point. Will he? Only time will tell. Again, J. Bo in this indictment is a classic example. You gotta watch. Words are powerful. You got to watch what you let people call you. Blue Da Vinci says they called j Bo Jr. Boss sort of as a joke. The feds used it in the indictment and said he was second in command, whatever that means, of Big Meech's operation. And now j Bo is accused of committing PPP fraud, which is a crime, but a lot of people did PPP fraud. I don't. They have them lumped in with some other people with drug charges. Why are they in the same RICO? if j doesn't have drug charges. So j served about 11 years on a 15 to 20 year plea for his original BMF case. There were 34 people uh, indicted in this St. Louis operation. Uh, I just mentioned a few of the major ones with the fentanyl and meth. Those people face a long time. 50 Cent sees it as yet another money-making opportunity. He made kind of a Seems like a trolling joke or something. Uh, when when the news of j being indicted came out, he posted a poll on his Instagram asking if people would watch a St. Louis BMF spinoff show. So that's all he thought about it. On a more somber note, there's been some deaths of people that were, I mean, there's a lot of names in the BMF cases. You can look at my story, United States versus BMF. It talks about the indictments in five different states. I think there was over a hundred, no, no, there was over a hundred people. Might have been more like 200 people in different cases. The feds at least referred to them as BMF cases, but a guy named Christopher Pig Triplett, whose name is in the 
infamous uh, uh, Maria, Mario, whatever her name is, Shaloub, book that first kind of exposed a lot of people to BMF. Christopher Pig Triplet was found gunshot wounds and is still running 2020 Chevy Malibu back in 2020 there in River Rouge, right on the edge of Detroit. That's the neighborhood he grew up in. They think a car drove by and shot into his car. So it sounds like he was sitting there waiting for somebody. Pig is my daddy. I miss him so much. I miss him every day. I know some of you all don't want to come forward because y'all want to, you know, think that y'all a snitch. But you ha we have a family that's hurting and we need to know. Now, uh, Mr. Triplett was in the book because it was one of the cases him getting caught with uh, Calvin Playboy Sparks was one of the, I guess, important things leading up to the indictment. They got caught in Missouri with, a lot of stuff happened around Missouri. A uh, guy, my buddy Jabari Hayes, that I interviewed, he was a driver, he got caught near Missouri. A lot of people coming in and out of that St. Louis hub. J Master J was picking up his dope from Southwest T in St. Louis. St. Louis is very important to the case, but anyways, uh, Christopher Pig Triplet was pulled over with Calvin Playboy Sparks. They had nine kilos of cocaine. Uh, phone calls immediately begin. Mr. Sparks' people were concerned that Christopher Pig Triplet would cooperate. Southwest T got on the phone, not knowing his phone was tapped or under surveillance and said, oh, don't worry about him, he'll be stand up and, and there's no, uh, no one thinks that Mr. Triplett uh, turned state's evidence in the initial BMF case. He, he uh, did six years uh, for that original case for nine kilos of coke in St. Louis. He got out and say, I don't know, 2011, 2012. By 2014, he was locked back up. He was caught with the brick of H in Ohio, hidden in the, uh, a brick of H hidden in the air filter of his car. He served four years on that case. Nine kilos isn't a lot, but because he jumped on the phone, well, not that he jumped on the phone, I'm sorry, because Southwest T was talking a lot with uh, Calvin Playboy Sparks' family. That was a primary uh, wiretap that was used in the indictment operation Motor City Mafia, and um, Mr. Triplett was back hanging out a lot in Detroit. One of my friends was good friends with him. I did an interview about him. My friend met him back in like 02 when my friend was selling uh, very expensive marijuana back before that was super prevalent. Triplett would buy lots from him and had him come to Southwest Detroit and Southwest T and a bunch of other people would just buy everything he had, thousands and thousands of dollars in 50s at a time, so that was an interesting story. I got the link to it in the description. Now, why did Mr. Triplett lose his life? Several sources told Scott Bernstein, one of my journalistic partners over at our website, Gangster Report, that uh, it was over a woman. Could be. Uh, I don't think anyone's ever been arrested for it at this point. Word on the street I heard from some people is that something to do with him informing in his case with the brick of H in Ohio, but again, that's just based on what? I don't know, based on he didn't get enough time? Well, drug laws change. I mean, you know, different states are different. I don't know who did he tell on. I don't, I don't, I never heard anyone say who he specifically told on, so I think that's just innuendo and rumor, just like a woman did it. But obviously somebody set him up because he was sitting there in his car and you could think it was a robbery, like he was doing a deal and someone and ran off, but I guess the shots came from outside. Either way, rest in peace to Calvin Triplett. Now, an even more disturbing story 
of a former BMF indictee that was close to the center of action because there's more than one uh, deceased person in it. Man, I can't take this. I love you, little cuz. They'll mourn you on social media these days right after they're the one that put you in the grave. This picture and post is from a guy, Michael D'Angelo Griffin, former Detroit resident, who was living in Alabama when he got involved in a multi-state cocaine conspiracy with a Mexican named Mariano Lazoya Garcia out of Brownsville, Texas. Brownsville sits right on the border. That's where a lot of stuff comes in at. So, what does this have to do with BMF? Well, okay, here we go. So, Eden is a, grew up in Detroit. The deceased Mr. Eddins grew up in Detroit, played football at Crockett's High School, Detroit Public Schools. And he went on, he was like all, all city, went on to play for uh, Ball State, I think in Ohio. He got drafted, he played for the Bills for one game, Buffalo Bills. Then he went into the Canadian Football League, played for a couple years. And in 2014, his football career ends. And apparently, you know, this happens with a lot of people to get a taste of the money from entertainment or sports, and then it's gone. You know, they, that lifestyle goes from 100 to zero. And the easiest way to get back into money flowing is dope. But selling, selling dope it's like learning a trade. It's like being a carpenter or anything else. Trust me, if you didn't grow up around that type of, like not just in a neighborhood where there's someone on the corner doing it, but I'm talking about in your household and you have it, you didn't come up selling little drugs and a little more than a little more and you're around it and you know how it goes, it's easy to get in way over your head. So this guy, Michael Griffin is, best friends, whatever that, that means, with this former NFL player from Detroit, Robert Eddins. Griffin's from Detroit, too. He's living in Birmingham, Alabama. They meet a Mexican, uh, uh, Garcia, Lazoya Garcia, Mariano. They meet a Mexican, Mariano Lazoya Garcia. I don't know if he was part of the cartel or what. He's giving them 10 bricks at a time. They're splitting it in half. Griffin is selling his in Birmingham and Eddins is bringing his back up to Detroit. This goes on probably less than two years. I don't know how many loads they got. You can see here from the federal documents. Also in this federal document, a picture I'm not gonna show, it's of the crime scene, and it's of Mr. Eddins laying on the ground with pillow over his head in the basement. And he still has on the same clothes he had on with this surveillance photo from Best Buy where he went with his best friend, Michael Griffin, just like an hour before he was. And while they were at Best Buy, guess who was back at this little house that Mr. Eddins inherited from his grandmother on one of Detroit's lovely streets, the 7900 block of Pearson, which is Burt Road near Tyron. Ricardo Slick McFarlane was back at this house and he was cuffed up and uh, while Eden was at Best Buy with the so-called friend, some other guys that, that Michael Griffin had had uh, Rico McFarlane cuffed up and he, in the crime scene photo, they're both on the ground um, deceased. Rico McFarlane was, had been friends with uh, Marlon Welch, who was the son of Tanisa, who, uh, who Southwest T's wife or common law wife, I don't know. She's the one, she's been interviewed on First Ladies of BMF and all that, Tanisha Welch. I think she was indicted as well. She did some time. I think her son did some time, but uh, Rico, I think the way he was involved with BMF, he was friends with her son, Southwest T's stepson. He was only 22 when he got like about a 10 year sentence uh, for his involvement in BMF. So I don't know how many years of the good life he lived, but then he went and did 10 years. And Mr. McFarland had only been out of federal prison for 10 weeks. How he knew Eden was that just his friend, I think they're around the same age. 
did Ed in, enlist McFarlane because he just got out and he was like, oh, you're in BMF and you must have customer. Who knows? There's nothing about that in the federal report. And it's really not relevant because Mr. McFarlane is a victim of a homicide. He wasn't under investigation for any drug dealing. Feds didn't see fit to talk about what they thought the two of them were doing together because it really doesn't matter. But Michael Griffin and Eddins and this Mexican had a ongoing interstate conspiracy. So Eddin couldn't pay his tab and his so-called friend comes up north with another guy he got from Mississippi. They're on the phone with the Mexican and they're exchanging texts about something about they'll bring all the money in. Probably Eddin gave his bricks to somebody who wasn't paying him. Maybe he asked McFarland to help him collect the money or something. McFarland clearly didn't know what he was getting into because they both ended up deceased. And this guy, Michael Griffin, what a bad person. He's... So this particular case, if you are thinking about interstate narcotics traffic, and this will make you think twice. I don't know, I guess Griffin must have been so scared of the Mexican. But of course, if you and your friend owe money to someone dangerous, the two of you are supposed to go to war with them. Not you kill him. He just wanted to keep the dope coming. Because just the way he got caught a few weeks later, they pull him over in Louisiana and they had a kilo of H. Well, they thought they had a kilo of H. They get booked in for that. Turns out that was fake. Now, whether they were about to use that to cut or that the Mexican had given them something fake or they were trying, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if he was still trying to pay off his ticket to the Mexican by selling somebody a fake brick of H. No idea. But at that point, the case unravels. The guy from Mississippi and Griffin are both sentenced. Now, in the newspaper stuff you'll read and in the federal uh, press release, it talks about them getting, well, there's no murder charges. There's some weird charge of interstate travel to kill and drug trafficking, but there's no murder charge. Um, and it talks about them getting 30 years, or it sounds like they're getting 30 years, but... And Michael D'Angelo Griffin, as you can see here, he ain't getting out till 2044. He's sentenced out of Alabama, Birmingham. That's where, that's where they took the case to. So it sounds like he got sentenced for the conspiracy starting out of Alabama, not for any crime that occurred in Detroit. So two young guys killed in this house in Detroit. And while the people that did it are getting a bunch of time, well, some of them. There's no actual charges for them taking these two guys' life. So life, life is cheap out on the mean streets of the big city. Mr. McFarland was living good in the BMF days, and he had to pay for it with 10 years, and then he was only out 10 weeks, which is sad. As far as the Mexican, I don't think he's been sentenced yet. You know how that goes with them. He's probably telling on somebody in Mexico, and he may disappear into the criminal justice system under some other name and never be heard from again. And uh, the guy from Mississippi, the other person that helped take the life of uh, Mr. Eddins and Mr. McFarland, he's, uh, he only got about, I think, 10 or 12 years. So rest in peace, Rico Ricardo Slick McFarland. Blue Da Vinci update, of course. Blue Da Vinci did a lot of interviews. He did some with me to clear the air in his name about everyone saying he was snitching. There's been a huge amount of back and forth between him and others. And go look at my interviews I did with him about two hours worth, or you can watch many interviews with him. Now, basically what it boils down to with Blue and whether he snitched or not is, again, well, I didn't watch all this stuff and read everything. I don't know what people exactly claim. Him and J-Bo went back and forth. Mainly what I got out of it is that he was sentenced under his sentencing guidelines. Now, you can get sentenced under your mandatory minimum sentencing guidelines because of something called the federal safety valve. 
So if you meet certain criteria, they can depart. They can do a lower downward departure. So your mandatory is supposed to get seven. I think that was him, and he got five or something like that. Now, if you read the safety valve, what you have to do to qualify is like nonviolent, first offender, some other stuff, and he met all those requirements. And then the fourth clause, the fourth requirement, you have to give any and all information relevant to any crime you are involved in. So people say, oh, that must mean he told. But the fifth clause, or the fifth stipulation, is that if you don't have any information to give about anything, they can't prevent you from getting the safety valve. So Blue's contention is that, yeah, I had a meeting with the feds to take this plea agreement, and they ask you, do you have any information we don't know? Well, at that point, the case had already, he, did, he got indicted in the second wave in Atlanta. The first case in Detroit had already happened. There was no new information to tell. I mean, that sounds believable. I mean, I don't know, but that sounds believable. Now, some people say, or the word on the street, he's the one that told the feds how to find the limousine that had $900,000 in it. I don't know, is that true? But to be frank, so what if he did? Like, if he got saved himself two years in prison just to tell them where some money was at, that was hidden in a secret compartment in a limo that was getting passed around from dealer to seller and was gonna eventually go to a, a compactor and have the steel recycled like all cars. So what? I mean, there was, it wasn't like he sent them over to somebody's house. I don't, I'm not saying he even sent them to the limo, I don't know. But that's what some people say. But I say if he got two years less for turning that money in, I mean, I'm gonna call that snitching. That's kinda, kinda crazy. So. Did Blue give some type of information? Listen, he was in the second indictment. Realistically, it was all bad long before he got picked up. So different people have different qualifications of what some people say you even sit in a room with the feds, you're you're dry, I don't know. But I do know the downward departure stipulation five, if you don't have any new information to give. They can't keep you from getting the downward departure. So his story does make sense. And now to the last interesting update. Did Southwest T and Big Meech become informants of some sort? Southwest T got out like 12 years early. Now this was during COVID when a lot of people were getting out and he had health problems and whatever. Friend of mine got out quite a bit early from a long sentence, and I know he didn't tell because I know who paid for his lawyer and I know who signed his uh, waiting employment letter, and it possibly was me. So, but he definitely didn't tell. A lot of people got out who definitely didn't tell. People say that Southwest T, well, some reporters, I mean, I say people, Southwest T cleared up the Jam Master J murder. Now, it is true the feds were trying to make Jam uh, Southwest T testify. They gave him a subpoena because Jam Master J's whole case centered around that there was a dispute over 10 kilos that had come from Southwest T because him and Jam Master J had an ongoing relationship. But Southwest T didn't testify. And if they had only let him out of prison because he was going to testify, I'm sure they would have wrote it up in such a way because he's still, he's under, like he's not free. He's like, he's on home confinement. He's technically still a prisoner, I think. So like if he was in some agreement with the feds and he didn't follow it, they could roll him up, put him back in prison. They could have really applied pressure, but they subpoenaed him in the J Master J and he, he uh, I guess he took the fifth or whatever, but he, he didn't testify as far as I know. Did he tell them something off the record? I mean, you could say he did, who knows? I mean, I, that would just be a rumor to say that. Would they let a guy out 15 years early because he told them something off the record about an unsolved murder from 20 years ago? I highly doubt it. If they were doing that, I mean, 
A lot of people would get themselves out of prison if it was that easy. Easy to say rumors about Southwest T, but doesn't nothing uh, turn state's evidence or helped him out with the Jam Master J case. No real evidence of that, and he didn't testify. Now, and the, finally, the most famous BMF person, of course, Big Meech, whose son is starring in the hit show, BMF. Good for him. Meech did just get his sentence lowered by 32 months. If you were wondering, was that a rumor or not? As you can see here, he's scheduled to get out at the beginning of 2026. I would imagine there's at least six months of halfway house time before that. He's going to be out 2025. So probably in the next 18 months, he'll be on the street. And not long after that, he'll be able to go to a, a nightclub hosted by Big Meech. Pay your $200 to get in because I'm sure he'll have a lucrative uh, party circus set up. Him and his son, oh man, they gonna make a lot of money doing parties. That's what I predict. And then he'll go on to do other stuff. I mean, if you would have told them two guys in the beginning and the end, T, you're gonna do 13 years and get out and be stuck at, stuck at a house in Detroit, but nonetheless out, meet you're gonna do 20 and get out. That wouldn't have sounded that bad. Sounds a lot better than 30. Now, did Meech go bad? So people out of St. Louis definitely feel so, and some people say some people in Detroit feel like that. It's all based on Tammy Cowens, who was Meech's kind of doing tasks for him on the outs. She was a woman in Atlanta. The feds say Meech was organizing drug deals, suppliers for the people in St. Louis, and the someone that Meech had was a, was a fed, and Tammy Collins, was, it's pretty messy. All the paperwork's, this is just a general overview. You can read the paperwork. I did some other stories about it. You can read it for yourself. Because if you're interested in this type of stuff, you need to go read the document yourself. Long story short, Tammy Collins was definitely working with the feds. Meech and the St. Louis guys were probably going to be in a conspiracy together because, because of her, I think, and her mistake. But she was sleeping with the DEA agent, which Meech may have told her to do, which was very smart. So the judge threw out the whole case. So there was no case. The St. Louis... Um, uh, Dion Gatling, Mr. Gatling serving a long prison term now for some other stuff he's convicted of that wasn't related to that. He definitely feels like, you know, Meech put him with the feds. I mean, it's kind of messy. I mean, I can see how he would feel that way. To me, it seems like they were, Meech was trying to do stuff in prison maybe and almost got caught up. Tammy Cowens definitely worked with the feds. So then you would say, well, if Meech continues to work with her, he's no good. Well, she got him a TV show and kept his name alive and his son is on a, on a TV show. So trust me, when it comes to repercussions from telling, I mean, life is all about who you break the rules for and picking and choosing. I've been with bigger drug dealers than them. And they're like, oh, do you want to, you know, from back in the day, oh, do you want to interview so-and-so? I can get him on the phone. And I was like, didn't he tell on you? Yeah, but I mean, we were selling a million dollars worth of dope every day. We were going to prison. He just did what he had to do and he's got a, you know, a kid with my relative and what are we gonna do? That was 30, 40 years ago. Definitely it's all picks and chooses in the game and Big Meech and BMF at this point is a legend. He did get 32 points. Oh, to go back to why he got 32 months off his sentence, it wasn't because of any information. Like I said with Mr. Triplett, sentencing laws change. There's been Meech, Got a, got a statutory points reduction. And he had the lawyer, Wade Fink, whose father, Neil Fink, R.I.P. Neil Fink, I once had briefly. 
a long time ago as a lawyer. He's a famous lawyer in Detroit. Wade Fink got him the 32 months off. So Meech is coming home soon. Southwest T is home. Rest in peace, Calvin Triplett. Rest in peace, Mr. McFarlane. Blue Da Vinci. Definitely plausible that he didn't get his sentence reduction from telling, but I don't know. Chabo has a fraud case. Best of luck to him, and I hope they don't give him some, some further drug charges. And BMF is more famous than ever. And I don't watch the show, but people love it. It's on season three. And I'm sure when Meech gets out, there'll be more content, more stuff. Probably BMF is going to be something you hear about forever. The greatest show on earth, I guess. But it's definitely the most famous brand in crime since 